second section of the mechanical properties of materials, we will discuss a very important concept called tensors. Because so far you know about uh, the scalars and vectors. For example, when you talk about any you know simple numerical counting of a system, you talk about uh, say, you know the uh, kind of uh, systems which are scalars. But when you talk about something which has a sense of direction, let us say force one example, then you talk, talk about it in terms of a vector. But when we talk about stress, okay, so we actually would refer to stress not like only one direction associated with it, but if you consider for example, for a three dimensional space, then you have you know something like nine components of stress. So, for this kind of a situation, we need uh, a kind of a more generic abstract way of describing the system and that will be in terms of uh, tensors. Okay. So, that is what uh, we will be doing for both stress as well as for strain. So, this is kind of a generalization first of all on scalars and vectors. Okay. Now, uh, how do we define uh, the uh, tensor? Uh, for say st uh, stresses and strains before we say that, we can also uh, show that how scalars and vectors could be a special case of tensors okay, of certain ranks. The rank of a tensor is defined by the number of directions or dimension of the array that is required to describe it. Okay. So, suppose we are talking of an n dimensional space and we are talking of a tensor with r direction or rank. R, then it can be represented by C component such that n to the power R equals to C. Now, let us try to use this in terms of our day to day experience. Suppose we talk of a scalar quantity, that means say how many pens, you ask me how many pens do I have in my pocket. Okay? So, suppose if I have a one pen in my pocket, then this is a scalar quantity and this scalar quantity can be considered to be a tensor of rank 0 in a 3 dimensional space. In other words, n is here 3, r is here 0 and hence 3 to the power 0 that is only one component without any sense of direction, the number of pens that is only the number itself that is a scalar quantity. Now, suppose we talk about that uh, how do we move from a position A and to a position B. So, now I do not only need the distance to cover, but also I need to say that which direction I will be covering. Okay? Okay? So, some for example, you have to go this way and this way, the combination of directions in order to reach this location. So, if you have this kind of a sense of direction, that means you have a magnitude as well as the direction that is associated. So, it is uh, 3 to the power 1 now in a 3 dimensional space that means you need 3 components uh, and uh, no wonder that any vector uh, in a 3 dimensional space uh, you always denote it with respect to 3 unit vectors if you remember i, j and k. So, that you can actually say that this distance uh, d is nothing but something like x i, y j and z k. Okay. So, that is how you define the you know uh, vector in terms of the distance of uh, velocities etcetera. There are many such things where this you know first rank of tensor is important. When we will talk about stress, the stress is actually a uh, something which is of rank 2. So, it is a tensor of rank 2 which is also known as a dyad. Okay. So, that means here uh, you need a magnitude as well as two directions every time that means it is 3 square or in other words 9 components are needed in order to define the stress at a point. Okay. So, that is why I told you earlier that uh, just a very simple generalization of a stress as a force per unit area 
does not really make a sense because which area are we talking about. Now, you have a much better definition of stress that suppose you consider a point and you have a you consider a cube all around this point okay that is what we are showing here right a cube all around this point and on that cube so you have uh, you know various surfaces on the cube right and uh, if you look at it that uh, you have uh, you need actually you know three normal components okay and six shear components so sigma x x sigma y y sigma z z three normal components and six shear components okay why do you need six shear because there are some shears like sigma x y and sigma y x which are actually same shear and complementary shears are there so you need three normal and uh, you know uh, the six to total you need nine components okay in order to define the stress at a point and that is a, a tensor of rank 2 that is what is also known as a dyad okay so thus just like stress is a tensor a dyad uh, of uh, you know that is of rank 2 tensor similarly strain is also a exactly the same way a tensor of rank 2 so you need you know two rank 2 tensors to define the stress and the strain. Naturally, uh, you know if you are talking about modulus of elasticity, then actually you need a rank 4 for you know in order to define the relationship between the two dyads. Okay? Now, there is something more. So, that is about the stress. Uh, the other interesting thing is the Poisson's ratio. Okay? Uh, this refers to that when I am actually extending a material, let us just take this example that uh, you know uh, we are extending a material okay, in one direction. Uh, suppose we are taking the material uh, like a dog bone shape in a universal testing machine and I am applying the tensile force. Okay, this is a rubber sample and you can see that how the thickness is reducing in the other direction. So, this being a rubbery material which has a Poisson's ratio close to 0.5, this shows beautifully that how it is narrowing down in the direction perpendicular to the application of the force. Okay. So, this uh, you know nature of a material is actually depicted by uh, what we call the Poisson's ratio of the material. So, that is the Poisson's ratio which is the ratio of the lateral strain to the tensile strain. Now, if a material does not exhibit this behavior, there are some materials which does not exhibit this behavior. For example, a bottle in a cork uh, of, of a bottle, they generally neither expand uh, you know in terms of when you are compressing it or nor the other way round. So, they have a Poisson's ratio which is close to 0. In fact, cork's Poisson's ratio is nearly close to 0. Most of the other materials in the day to day experience that you use, for example, the metals, they have a Poisson's ratio between 0.25 to 0.3, etcetera. Okay. Concrete has a Poisson's ratio of 0.2, and rubber has a Poisson's ratio, as I have just now shown you, and that has a Poisson's ratio close to 0.5. Can a material have a negative Poisson's ratio? That means, when we are actually, you know, a contracting the material or expanding the material let us say just like that rubber experience when I am expanding the material instead of contracting can it expand on the other direction? Yes, in certain cases it can. Let me just show it to you through an example. Now, this is actually a you know a kind of a re-entrant honeycomb structure. This is a this is a oxetic structure. So, in this oxetic structure if you look at it that it is the each of the honeycombs instead of the honeycomb with a positive angle they are having a negative angle each one of them and these what happens in such a case suppose now i am trying to expand the material so i am expanding it in this direction you see that uh, the other direction that is in the perpendicular direction instead of contracting it is actually expanding the more these reentrance angles are actually unfolding, it is expanding more and more. So, and the other way when I am compressing, you can see other directions 
instead of expanding it is also getting contracted in the other direction. So, expansion is creating expansion, compression is creating compression. That is the beauty of an auxetic structure of a structure which is having a, you know a negative Poisson's ratio. So, we have talked about uh, you know various types of uh, Poisson's ratios okay, and uh, that definitely is a very important uh, consideration a material property consideration when we are actually selecting a material. Now, we also have talked about stress and strain. The stress and strain are related by something which is known as the uh, you know Hooke's law. Okay. So, uh, there are of course, the Hooke's law uh, which uh, actually can be considered as a relationship between a single stress uh, you know factor and a single strain or in a generic sense uh, between a stress tensor and a strain tensor. Okay. So, in that case if I consider the relationship to be a matrix relationship that means, sigma i j okay, equals to in that case it will be you know, e i j k l epsilon k l. Okay. So, that is the most generic Hooke's law. So, basically Hooke's law is something which is relating between the stress and strain and each stress and strain component uh, in, you know within a linear elastic domain is generally found out to be uh, having a proportionality. That means, you know if you increase the stress uh, two times the strain also will increase two times. So, there is a sense of proportionality that will that will be there between the two. Okay. So, that is uh, you know the simplest form of the Hooke's law which we also uh, call you know we also refer that if we do it for a component then this actually the E becomes what we say as the Young's modulus named after one of the most famous physicist and physician uh, Sir Thomas Young uh, who had first uh, you know made very important notes on elastic behavior of materials. Now, uh, the way a normal stress component is proportional to a strain component and related by Young's modulus. Similarly, if you have a shear stress component that will be proportional to shear strain and there the modulus of elasticity is referred as shear modulus or G. And if you remember the case of that hydrostatic pressure case, uh, there actually it is not happening the change in a direction, but in terms of a volume change. So, so you consider it for any fluidic case. So, that is why the negative sign is actually introduced here, because uh, the positive pressure uh, causes a shrinkage of volume. So, uh, you know here you get uh, the volume change uh, as uh, the you know volumetric strain and that is related with the hydrostatic pressure and hence the modulus here is known as the bulk modulus. So, we have three different modulus, okay. the elastic modulus in the first case which is Young's modulus, shear modulus and bulk modulus. All three modulus however, have the same unit in terms of the unit of the stress, because the strain is unitless. So, it has the same unit as the unit of the stress. Okay. So, that is about the Hooke's law. Now, uh, and which correlates between the stress and the strain and you can get actually the elastic modulus of the system. The point is that this elastic modulus varies uh, and this is a measure of actually the stiffness of the system. Okay. Uh, the way you know very easily I work with the rubber sample with a steel sample if you give me I may not be able to work so easily. So, it has a higher stiffness that means a higher modulus of elasticity. Now, this is a depicted in a beautiful chart from uh, actually Asby and uh, Jones uh, and that you know gives the elastic modulus for different groups or types of materials. For example, if you consider ceramics, they have generally a very high elastic modulus like diamond and then uh, they may have some uh, you know some of the things which may have lower modulus of elasticity. Uh, something like you know 
uh, say for example, the glasses or the eyes or the graphite, okay, uh, the cement, they may have somewhat lower modulus of elasticity, but in general ceramics have reasonably high modulus of elasticity. If you look at the metals, there are some metals which shows quite high modulus of elasticity. For example, tungsten is one of them, chromium is another of them, no matter that is why for the making the super alloys this kind of materials are used because they deform much less with the same application of force and uh, you know uh, then where is uh, the you know so iron and steel is uh, here for example, 200 giga Pascal kind of a thing and then much much softer ones are for example, aluminum or zinc or tin, magnesium, they are much much softer in terms of the metals. Now, if you look at the polymers, you can see that there is nothing here. That means, the polymers are a degree you know several orders of magnitude lower in terms of the stiffness and they are uh, you know something like that is why I told you that about 2 giga Pascal is something maximum that we generally observe and they are in the higher range you get something like polymethyl, methacrylate, polystyrene, nylons etcetera and those which are very low are something like foamed polymers, PVCs, rubbers etcetera. They show very low modulus of elasticity or in other words uh, the compliance is very high in such material. Then if you look at the composites, composites uh, you know the natural composites are generally softer something like woods etcetera, but uh, the man made synthetic composites actually have modulus of elasticity which is comparable with the metals CFRPs, fiber glasses etcetera. So, that is why composites are replacing the metals uh, you know wherever the high stiffness is required. So, uh, so, that is uh, you know kind of a comparison chart which you can you know keep in your mind. In terms of the absolute values here you know once again I have given three values we have given from Callister here and just for reference for example, if you consider aluminum approximately 70 giga Pascal modulus of elasticity, shear modulus is approximately 25 and Poisson's ratio is approximately 0.3. So, uh, in, again in this list you would see that a high modulus of elasticity you are finding in something like tungsten okay? and uh, the shear modulus is also high in that same range, but shear modulus is usually always lower in comparison to the uh, you know mod Young's modulus of the system. What does it mean? It means that you know you can actually shear the material or twist the material, deform the material in the shearing mode much easily uh, instead of actually elongating or compressing the material. Okay. And the Poisson's ratio you can see is not really varying, it is more or less in a range of uh, something like 0 0.3 around that range okay, for most of the metals. So, this is just for a comparison of uh, these properties in various metals. Now, uh, we carry out uh, you know how do we measure this property. In order to measure this property, we use a tensile testing system okay, uh, in a machine uh, which is known as actually universal testing machine in which we find out properties like uh, for example, ultimate tensile strength, yield strength, okay, percentage elongation, Young's modulus of elasticity etcetera. So, I have just now shown you that in a UTM machine how we are you know we can deform the rubber specimen the same specimen that I have shown you okay, can be used in this case. Universal testing machine is a beautiful machine where you can actually load a sample uh, in various ways tension, compression, shear not only that the loading can be made dynamic loading uh, and which can include things like fatigue etcetera. So, uh, that is uh, you know how do we generally carry out this uh, universal testing uh, you know machine the tensile testing. Okay. Now, if you carry out such testing of a ductile metal, okay, how would you find out the stress strain diagram and that is the you know uh, the engineering stress strain 
diagram of the material, how do you usually uh, see the stress strain diagram. If you look at it, that the stress strain diagram shows certain features, but please keep in mind that this is for a ductile metal. Okay. So, you will see that there is an initial region where uh, you know the material, if you actually uh, unload the material, it will come back to the same point itself and that is known as the elastic limit. Okay. That means, the maximum stress that it can withstand without any measurable permanent strain after unloading. Now, in the elastic limit of course, there are two regions, in one region up to some region it is actually perfectly linear and beyond that it is slightly nonlinear, but still if you release in the nonlinear region it will come back to its original position. That is uh, what is the defines the elastic limit. Now then the point comes here that is the yield strength point, beyond the yield strength point if you actually deform the material then it will start to deform plastically. So, what it means is that beyond that point if you actually start to unload there will be some amount of deformation which will always remain into the system and that is why the yield strength position is very important because that says the onslaught of actually plastic deformation in the system. Okay. So, as I as I am increasing the load I am going beyond the yield strength level and I am actually watching the uniform plastic deformation. Now, if I increase the load further, what is going to happen is something like a necking phenomena that would start to happen okay, and then the material will go to the fracture. Okay. So, that is what you know generally happens for a ductile material. So, in that beyond that necking point what you get you know is a non-uniform plastic deformation. So, the plastic strain itself can be divided into two part, one is the when it is uniform plastic deformation okay, that is the first part and then when there is a non-uniform plastic deformation till failure. Okay. So, that is what we will find into the system and what is the point that is important for us is that up to the necking you know we get actually the ultimate tensile strength. So, that is the maximum load divided by the original cross sectional area of the system that gives us the ultimate tensile strength. Okay. Beyond that you would not expect a strength of the uh, material because beyond that if you take the force it is actually going uh, to take us towards the fracture. That is why ultimate tensile strength plays a very important role in terms of the uh, product design. And also the other two important factor is that what is the percentage elongation that is the you know ratio of the difference of final to initial length change over the initial length and similarly for the area. So, that actually tells us that how compliant is the material. So, this is a typical stress strain curve for a ductile material. How will it look like for a brittle material? Okay, I can just you know very in a very small qualitative manner we can draw it here that suppose the stress is denoted by sigma and strain by epsilon. So, if I draw the sigma epsilon for a brittle material it is just one single line okay, and uh, maybe some point of uh, nonlinearity, but that is it and then it sharply fails. That means, it will not show any plastic strain, any plastic deformation okay. that is a generally happens in terms of the brittle material. The other important point here is that uh, generally the yield strength if you do not find a very sharp point where this you know this is happening we consider approximately this point 002 level that means the 2 percent strain level we find out that where it is intersecting and that point is defined as the yield strength level because that is generally the strain level which it can take in general in metals without any permanent deformation but this is very specific to the metals for the uh, things like elastomers or rubbers this can become something like 5 percent to 10 percent. Okay. So, depending on the material this position may change. Now then uh, you know we uh, if we actually consider however, the true stress strain curve that means, if we consider that the area is actually changing if you look at it that as you are deforming uh, you know this area is actually changing this area is becoming smaller and smaller 
the neck formation is happening. So, the area is changing and if you consider that actual area, you will see that it is not actually the stress strain curve is not drooping, but it is actually increasing and it is increasing because even if the you know the force you are increasing the area is actually decreasing at a very rapid rate. So, that is why the you know or it, the true stress actually is increasing at a very rapid rate. Now, in the uniform plastic deformation the stress strain relationship is actually governed by a power law uh, which is like sigma t is k times epsilon t to the power n where this n is uh, 0 for perfectly plastic solid n is 1 for elastic solid okay. and for most metals it will be in the plastic region between 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. So, that is how it would behave you know the in the true stress state curve okay, which we uh, generally you know uh, overlook actually we only look at the uh, stress strain curve that comes after the UTF machine. So, the true stress strain curve actually true stress is uh, denoted by this uh, relationship which is uh, something like the sigma t as sigma times the 1 plus epsilon and the true strain epsilon t is log of 1 plus epsilon. Okay. And uh, the relationship between engineering strain and true strain is governed by this relationship. So, this is what you can just uh, very simply you know uh, mathematically uh, you can actually obtain this relationship. Now, the other point is that the materials based on the stress strain relationships are actually divided into sub, sub categories like the homogeneous materials for which the properties are actually independent of where I am measuring the property. That means, here you get a property and here you get a property the all the directions if you look at it you are going to find the same modulus of elasticity, but it varies from direction to direction in one direction it is e 1 in another direction is e 2. So, that is what is a homogeneous material where at different points you get the same pattern of modulus of elasticity. For isotropic it is actually direction independent you get this uh, you know at a particular point if you consider you get E 1 in all the directions, but if it is not homogeneous then at a different point you get E 2 in all the directions and E 1 and E 2 are not the same, they are not the same. If they are same then they will become a homogeneous and isotropic material. And if we consider an orthotropic material in that case it is slightly different, in that case you will see that at different points it is homogeneous but the modulus of elasticity varies in different directions in the sense it varies in three different mutually orthogonal directions that will be e 1, e 2 and e 3. Uh, this is for generic you know general orthotropic material, but for specially orthotropic material uh, you know you may disregard one of them and it only varies in one set that means something like e 2 and e 3 will vary, okay, but E 1 may remain the same. So, that is what happens for spatially orthotropic material, spatially orthotropic. This is typically a case like if you consider a laminated composite, then each lamina which is very very thin in one direction are actually considered to be spatially orthotropic material. So, that is a very special case of a general orthotropic material. Now, uh, the relationship the elastic constants are actually related with each other by uh, the relationships which is uh, shown here that the E is uh, related to G and G is related to K okay. and uh, hence you know if you know actually for a linearly elastic isotropic and homogeneous material you need only two elastic constants and then the other two that means, we have uh, you know these four k, nu, e and g out of them any two if you give me I should be able to derive the other two provided the material is linearly elastic isotropic and homogeneous material. However, in case of an isotropic material there are 21 independent elastic constants. Okay. So, uh, it is a much much higher uh, you know 
uh, in terms of the variations. And if it is orthotropic material, then it has 9 independent elastic constants that will come into the picture. So, naturally the tailoring is much more for an orthotropic material. Now, that is the relationship you know in terms of the actually uh, the isotropic and orthotropic and anisotropic materials. The, so, that is about the stress strain relationship. Uh, there are some uh, other mechan mechanical properties which are also important. One of them is uh, ductility. I already talked about it that you know it is the how much you know is the capacity of how much you can draw a material under the tensile stress okay. and uh, that is very important. And there is uh, something that you will also see in terms of ductility which is known as the ductile failure the telltale sign of the neck formation of the system and uh, the brittleness of a system. So, the difference between a brittle and a ductile system I have already drawn the stress strain curve for a uh, you know uh, brittle system and a ductile system is that precisely this ray the app you know the presence of this plastic strain that is there for a ductile material and that is absent for a brittle material. So, that is very very important point that we have to keep in our mind while comparing between uh, various material properties. Now, the other important point here is actually the resilience of a material, which is the capacity of a material to absorb the energy okay, uh, elastically. So, it is in the elastic domain, when it is deformed elastically, you know how much of energy you can absorb. And if you consider the stress strain diagram and if you consider the area under the stress strain diagram, you can actually find out that this is something like you know sigma y square over 2 e in a kind of an approximate measure and that is. So, that means, if you know what is the ill stress and if you know what is the modulus of elasticity, you can actually compute that what is the resilience of the material in terms of modulus of resilience and how much of energy the material can absorb, which is very important in applications like spring type of applications. So, the resilience is another important mechanical property. The last important property in this direction is the toughness. Toughness is also the area under the stress strain curve just like the earlier uh, you know in this case, but here you are considering the plastic region also. Okay. So, earlier you are confining yourself within the elastic region, now you are considering the plastic region also. In fact, the test that is uh, very much important towards this direction are actually IZOD and Sharpie impact test. So, this, this is an IZOD impact test where actually you support the sample from one position uh, here, you are supporting the sample and you are hitting it through a pendulum. And if there is no sample, then it can go to a particular distance. If there is a sample there, then some energy is actually taken by it. So, it cannot go uh, you know up to that distance. So, you take that ratio of the two, the return ratio we call it and then that gives a measure of how much of energy is actually absorbed by the material and which is a measure of the toughness of the material. Now, similarly, uh, there is another very similar test actually which is known as the Charpie test. Now, the difference between the two tests, the IZOT test and the Charpie test is that in the IZOT test you have uh, you know for example, if I go to the last case you have the crack which is you make a notch actually and the notch actually faces the hammer. So, the hammer faces the notch you know. So, you are uh, in, in terms of Charpie as you can see on the other hand the notch is at the opposite side of the hammer. So, that is one of the difference between the two uh, you know and also in case of a Charpie test you are supporting the material at two places instead of at one location. But both of them are very good tests which can measure that how much of energy a material can absorb and that means how tough the material is and that actually means that you know how much is the impact strength that is there in the material. So, here is a, you know some kind of a comparison of a from the HB stable and as you can see here if you look at it uh, very closely that the metals are chopping in the least actually because they 
can absorb quite a good amount of uh, impact energy. And in fact, plastics even though they deform more, they cannot absorb that much of energy. Brittle materials of course, are the worst here. So, that is what is in terms of the three different you know groups of materials and composites are somewhere in between. Now, uh, the factors that are important in terms of the impact energy is that for a given material you know the impact energy will decrease if the yield strength is uh, increased. So, that is generally found in a material and the notch serves as a stress concentration zone. So, some materials are more sensitive to notches and the most of the impact energy is actually absorbed during the plastic deformation of the material. Also temperature and ductility plays a very important role on it. So, this is where we are going to close this lecture and in the next lecture we will uh, talk about some uh, a few more mechanical properties that is the hardness of the system, the creep of the system and the damping.